Today, I'm delighted to welcome Nicole Lamoureux, the Chief Human Resources Officer at IBM to the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Nicole, welcome to the show. As a former IBMer, I'm looking forward to our conversation and, and your predecessor at IBM, Diane Gearson, was uh, on the show back in 2020. And it remains one of our most popular episodes. So really looking forward to our conversation. Um, Nicole, you've been at IBM for, for 23 years. Um, to maybe start our conversation today, and for those um, aspiring HR leaders that are listening, can you share your journey that, that led you to where you are today as, as the CHRO? Yeah, well, great to be here first, David. And uh, as we were saying before this uh, recording started, once an IBMer, always an IBMer. So you're still part of the IBM family here. I started my time with IBM actually as an intern. I would say I stumbled into the human resources profession. I was very intent on becoming a lawyer and I wanted to go to law school, but I didn't have any money. And so for me, the HR job that I got at IBM was going to just be a slight detour. While I earned a little bit of money, I know I could have picked a different profession to maybe earn a little more money, but I picked HR and I... uh, started working with IBM. And I will tell you that I fell in love with the profession from, you know, the business impact that you could have, the people impact you could have, and then doing it at a company like IBM, which is hardware, software, services, 250,000 employees in 170 countries. Before I knew it, I was a couple decades in and continuing to love the domain. I did study under Diane Gerson, my uh, predecessor, and learned a lot about analytics and AI from her, which I know we'll talk about a little later here in the session. But across my career, I've been in virtually every HR domain. I did have the opportunity to do two international assignments, both in China during my career. And I took over in September of 2020 into the CHRO chair. So a little bit of an auspicious time to be taking over the role, but quick study and quick learning. That's what I would say about the last three and a half years. And it's it's interesting because I think a few of us stumble into the HR profession and the, some for many of us, once we're in there, we, we don't, we don't leave it. Um, and, and actually, one of the things I think we'll, we'll, we'll talk about throughout our conversation, Nicole, is, is that business focus that you mm-hmm. have in the HR um, function at IBM, which maybe not all companies have. Maybe some companies, the HR team is a little bit too much about HR, but I know that's, that's very different at IBM, and we'll talk about that. So, so over the years, um, obviously, you've been in the role now for four years and, and obviously worked closely with, for, for others that were doing the role beforehand. How have you seen the role of the CHRO change, you know, particularly now that we've entered the age of AI and particularly now that I think in more companies, HR has become a strategic business partner, maybe even the support function it was uh, years ago? Yeah. So I know, David, you know, maybe believers like you and me and others have always said that for most companies, product is not their strategic differentiator. It's their talent. Right. They can still have a great product, an above average product. And that's I'm not saying that's not important or a business model, but really what is a differentiator? Because you can over time start to copy business models, business processes, product over time in the long term. What really is a differentiator is your talent. And I think there were some believers early on, but I think in this age of disruption in the digital era where business models are starting to get on an even playing field, more and more companies are waking up to this idea of it is about the talent, it is about the people. So that is a big shift that I think is happening. I think the second thing that has happened is I know many CHROs and HR functions were thrown into it, but we really earned a lot of credibility during the pandemic. Do you think about health and safety of our employees? If I think adapting to new ways of working in remote work, adapting to differences in worldwide standards around vaccination and travel and shutdowns and working side by side with business leaders about then how their business model was impacted. There was also this piece that really business leaders started to see us in a new light 
in our ability to be agile, jump in, use data <laughs> to make decisions, deal with nuance and complexity. So those things are converging, which I think are putting CHROs and HR functions in a very different position in virtually every organization. It's interesting. I, I think right early in the pandemic, there was an article in The Economist that was much quoted by people that talked about the, the role of the CHRO in, in that crisis being as important as the CFO in the financial crisis. Um, and actually, it was quite prescient because it, it was actually in the early stages of the, of the pandemic and it actually came to be the case in, in many organisations. And as you said, it opened the eyes of executives. So now that they actually maybe saw what they hadn't seen before, I know that's not the case in IBM, but saw that they hadn't seen before that HR was actually a really strategic player at the, t at the top table. Yeah, absolutely. And now if you kind of fast forward to, okay, so here we are in AI, the era of AI, massive shift. CHROs are being asked to do a lot. HR functions are being asked to do a lot. They're being asked to, A, transform their own functions, right? More delightful people experiences, consumer grade employee experiences. They're being asked to make sure that we're optimizing budgets. Are we using the money that we have in the HR function and that we're deploying and the investments we're making in talent? Are we using it the right way? And AI is helping us do that. They're also being asked to manage this increasing world of complexity and compliance that can vary by country, state or province, city. And it doesn't mean just throw more people at the problem or the compliance work, but how do you use AI? So one big piece of this is CHROs are being asked to use AI to transform their function and the people experiences in their organizations. They're also being asked to reskill the workforce. Because AI is changing every job. So regardless of the jobs in your organization, HR functions are being asked to build retraining and skilling plans so that these professions, other professions, can then meet the needs. And then finally, CHROs and HR functions are being asked to do what I will call almost time study analysis about what time is being freed up? What does that mean for workforce planning? Do you backfill? And that is a really complex piece of workforce planning that is squarely falling on the shoulders of the HR function. So in this era of AI, I would say we're now, again, we're not hand in hand talking about shutdowns and vaccinations. We're now sitting side by side with business leaders talking about these elements. Yeah. And that's something that is a conversation that's going to take several years and keep evolving because the technology is evolving so fast, isn't it? Exactly. We are not an end state. So what we're reskilling for is going to constantly be a moving target or the impact on workforce planning is going to be a moving target as the technology evolves. Yeah, and I think we're going to probably talk about all three of those those sort of areas um, throughout. I definitely want to get into the workforce planning topic because I know it's something that you've been looking at for IBM for quite a long time about the skills-based work that you're doing, the skills-based organisation work that you're doing. We'll definitely come to that later. And then we'll talk about what it means for HR professionals themselves and the, the skills that we need to be to be able to execute on this. Absolutely. But let's, let's talk about first a bit about how you're incorporating AI and machine learning into, into HR at IBM. I know from my time at IBM, even even back in the before before the pandemic, that you know IBM is at, has been at the forefront of this, not just in helping the wider organisation transform, um, but also in actually in infusing AI machine learning into into its work. Can you can you share or give us maybe a, a sneak peek of some of the initiatives that you've been working on related to AI in HR at IBM? Absolutely. So within our talent, our people experiences, we're really using AI in what I'll kind of call three broad categories. The first, and David, you will remember this, we've been at this a long time, is around recommendations. So I'll use a very basic concept of recommendations. But this is where we've got AI-driven skills roadmaps or recommendations in our learning platform. When I log in and you log in, we'll see two totally different sets of recommendations because 
AI knows about my profile and my aspirations versus your profile and your aspirations. We use it in compensation. So when managers open their annual salary budget, that AI has recommended an ideal way to deploy that budget. Now, managers are still the decision makers, but it is there to make recommendations and help surface insights. So that's one area. And we've been at this actually from the very early stages of predictive analytics and neural networks all the way now through to generative AI. So we've been upgrading that capability. So recommendations is one. A second area that we have been using AI is in the area of what I'll call assistance. Some people call these, uh, you know, chatbots as an example. But this is where employees can go in and ask questions and the assistant is surfacing information. What's the vacation policy? Um, how do I transfer one employee to another manager? So that is where assistants are helping to surface information in very real ways. And we've been at that since 2017. The last category where we are using AI is what we call agents. So this is no longer about AI just surfacing information or making recommendations, but where AI is actually doing work. Some of us started experimenting with this in, in robotic process automation, RPA, but now with generative AI on the table, this is now intelligent automation where you literally have digital labor, digital workers working side by side with HR professionals. So these are the three broad categories. We can go deep on each one of them if you would like, but that's how we're thinking about transforming and using this technology to transform our HR function. Well, let, let's do that. I mean, particularly, <laughs> let's maybe start with the, um, the, the latter. I read something recently as a case study, I think, of Hero. Um, yes. um, and I think that falls into the, the third category, isn't it? The agent category. And, it, and it, uh, I'll let you tell the story because you'll tell it a lot better than me. But I was you know, super, super impressed because, you know, you could see the, the, the benefit for the business, but also the benefit for, 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 for the HR business partner and the benefit for the employees. And so now that I've set it up, hopefully, Nicole, I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> yes. So I will tell you a little bit about Hero. So if you asked the average HR partner or HR professional at IBM, name the one talent process you hate the most. We would hear almost unanimously, we would hear them saying the promotion process in consulting. So we have a large consulting business that runs an annual promotion process. And this is a process where people get promoted based on set criteria, their billable rates change. Those of you that may be listening that are in you know, some form of professional services, this would not su surprise you. And why our HR professionals disliked this process is, yes, it was a volume. You know, we run this process in 170 countries, you know, over 100,000 employees in some way, you know, are involved in this process. But HR professionals would tell us, one, they felt like all they were were what we call spreadsheet jockeys during this process. They were pulling data from our learning systems, our performance management systems, our client feedback systems, our skills taxonomy systems. They were pulling all of this data together, managing spreadsheets, sending it to managers who were making notations about who and shouldn't get promoted. Then there were comp recommendations being floated around. Sometimes they were correct. Sometimes there was mistakes. Payroll disliked that they had to do rework. Compensation was frustrated that we weren't always getting accurate information. It was a long process and nobody involved in it really felt that it was a delightful process. And then at the end of the day, we were getting feedback from managers that the administration of this process took so long that they weren't able to appropriately focus on how do you celebrate somebody's promotion? How do you prepare for a conversation to tell somebody they're not getting promoted? So we were really... We had redesigned processes. We had tried to make things simpler. We had automated spreadsheets. We had done training and nothing was changing. And so we felt like we needed a step change. 
And that's where we looked at the IBM technology. And there is a technology called Watson Orchestrate, which is intelligent automation. It's AI-driven automation. And it essentially is a digital worker. So now what will happen is Hero is the name of our digital worker. And I'll come back on the story behind that. But Hero is our digital worker. And what Hero does is Hero, you can create, here's the promotion criteria. So an HR professional will decide with the business leaders this year, here are the criteria. Hero will read that document, ingest that document. Hero will then go out to our HR systems, as disparate as they may be, pull together all of the information automatically, then send lists to 10,000 different managers, customized an email saying, Nickel, here's your promotion cycle is kicking off. Here's the criteria. Here's who's eligible in your organization. You, David, would get a different email. This is all happening without human intervention. The manager can then go back and say, I'd like to nominate these two people. This person's performance isn't where I'd expect it to be. Hero ingests all of that. Hero then, based on criteria we've given it, will make compensation recommendations that the managers can accept or adjust, and then send it directly to payroll. So then what is the HR professional doing in this time? They're handing any escalations or complex cases. They are also working with the managers to coach them on exactly what we just talked about. How are you going to celebrate David's promotion? How are you going to have a real conversation with Nicole about what her gaps are and why she's not getting promoted this cycle? And so all of this, it actually saved our managers over 50,000 hours last year, this promotion cycle. And we're getting better results, better feedback from employees and managers. We're getting zero defects on the way to payroll and compensation payments. And our HR professionals are now no longer dreading the promotion process. So that's one example of where a digital labor, an agent like this, is making a huge difference for us. And I think what's good, I'm going to come back to the hero pit in a minute, actually. But yeah, so two questions on that. Why hero? And then secondly, I think what it really shows us is that this isn't about replacing replacement. This is about augmentation. It's about pulling away all the administrative heavy frankly, quite cumbersome and quite boring tasks away and allowing the HR professionals to focus on what they do best for the, as you said, for the the escalation um, examples or the support for the manager so they can land the, land the, the good news or the bad news um, well. And that has a, you know, that has a better impact. That's better for the HR professional. It has a better impact for the people manager and the employee, as, as you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what I think is really important here. At no time is the AI running wild. The AI is not coming up with the rec- criteria for the promotion cycle. They're not blindly making compensation recommendations, right? It's all based on guidance that the experts are given. But what it's doing is pulling those reports from the different systems, putting them together, sending, cutting and pasting and sending different emails to different managers, compiling the file for payroll. That's stuff that HR professionals don't want to do. And so we always have a human in the loop, and that's really important for us on these agents, and we can talk more about that. So now why hero? So two reasons why hero. So the first one is, as we started this process, we thought, well, This agent will become the hero to the HR functions if we uh, actually land this correctly. But we we decided that in HR, for each team that puts in a digital agent somewhere into their process, that we always want to have an H and an R in the name. So hero, we've got Charlie and Sherlock and Hermione and Harry. So we are really kind of working through any names with H and R, but this is one example. Um, You know, Sherlock may not surprise you. Sherlock is our travel and expense. So as reconciliations are coming in, or there might be a deviation from policy, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of travelers a a year. And so how does that work through the process? Um, Hermione, post-job 
acquisitions for us. So builds job descriptions and then helps a talent acquisition professional post those job requisitions. And this is what we're working through of how can we take it exactly as you said, the administrative burden that exists in all of your our jobs, my job, your job, how can we start to take that work away so that we're freed up to do the stuff that we do best? No, that's really good. And I just thought of one for, for, for any assistant that can support with storytelling. Herodotus, there we are. That's got an H <laughs> and an R in it. it. So, I love uh, it. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite intelligent as well, hopefully as well. Maybe because I listened to a podcast with, I talked about Herodotus earlier, actually. Um, I love so, it. So I think that's a key a key point, isn't it? You, you, it's, you're balancing the recommendations generated by AI with human decision making. As you said, you know, the manager knows the, the people in the consulting teams. You know, he yes. knows he or she knows what, what their, their strengths and their weaknesses are. They make the decision. But Hero surfaces up, you know, takes the criteria and, and serves up the, 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 the recommendations, as it were, um, for, for the manager to then action. Absolutely. And look, I know this ship has already sailed, but if I could go back and rename AI, I would not call it artificial intelligence. I would call it augmented intelligence. For us, this is about enhancing humans. This is not about replacing them. And um, that's why we feel very strongly one of our principles in HR is that there will always be a human in the loop, that AI is not a decision maker. And it's the same, isn't it, with the recommendations? So if we go back to the learning recommendations yeah. as well, I mean, as an employee, as an IBMer, you, you you know, you share what where you'd kind of want to get to in the career in your career, um, at IBM or your career aspirations. Um, but it also looks at your skills, doesn't it? It also looks at your skills and maybe what adjacent skills that you've got, and and maybe will share information that the employee doesn't know, perhaps about what careers and roles are going to be in demand even more at IBM in years to come, and how that can give them a really good career path within the organization as well. So it's that balance, isn't it? But ultimately, it's up to the employee which what, what path they go down. Absolutely. And, you know, this is another good example where I think that we're trying to think about where do you infuse AI where it's going to have the biggest impact on the business. And we were hitting up against a few things when we started down this path, especially on the AI skills inference recommendations. So we had a skills taxonomy assessment that many organizations had in a very traditional way where employees and managers would fill out the taxonomy assessment on an annual basis. At one point, we moved to a biannual basis and one of the frustrations that came forward is we heard from both managers and employees, as soon as we fill it out, a week later, it's out of date. Our mm. employees are continuously learning new things or gaining different experiences or being deployed on new projects, working with different clients. And so how do you keep this updated? Because it feels a little bit like a waste of time. So how do you keep it updated in a living way. So at first, what we did was we used it for what we call skills inference. It was to take everything that it knew about my profile, your profile, as soon as I was deployed on a different client or got a project assessment back, or it would be looking at papers I published in our research division. And what the inference would do is anytime it thought that you had built a new skill, you might get an email that says, Nickel, have you gained a skill in Python? You know, we noticed you took this class, you worked for this client. And I might say, no, I was just testing out our learning system. I didn't really actually complete it. So no. Or I might say, yes. If hmm. I then change the skill, it will go to my manager for verification. But it was happening in a much more bite-sized, small way, employees validating it first in case it had picked up something wrong, and then managers signing off. Huge. But then we went a second step because then we started to get feedback to say, okay, so now the system is smart. It knows about me. But you still have the very standard, very tired learning roadmaps. So even though David and I are two totally different people with different sets of experience, if we go into a system and we say, tomorrow we want to become a blockchain developer, 
it's going to give us the exact same roadmap. And people were getting frustrated. I have to take things that I already know or already learn. And so now AI will generate customized roadmaps. It will take my profile, bump it up against the profile I want to become. And it might mm-hmm. say for David, it will take you 10 hours to become a blockchain developer. And Nicole, it might take you 10,000. And <laughs> here are the different things that you need to do to get there. And those real-time learning roadmaps that were customized to the individual, it does a couple of things for you. You get to reskill people faster because mm-hmm. you know it's really giving you just what you need to know. It's creating better engagement with the employees to want to take the learning because they're not repeating something or something that's already foundational to them. And it's allowing to get us talent to the right place at the right time. So that's an example of where for us, this has unlocked a ton of business value, particularly in a professional services business. And I think because there's lots of of talk about skills-based organizations and uh, a few naysayers as well. But I think what what you've done at IBM and maybe that's a lesson for other companies is you very much, you, you knew what the business objectives were before you embarked on this journey. And I, from, from memory, it was very much linked to, to the transformation that IBM was on in the, in the 2010s. It was a pretty significant exactly. transformation. Um, exactly. And maybe also talks to what you said at the start about talent making the organization because IBM's transformed successfully a number of times over its history, hasn't it? But, but this, skills, this skills element really helped support that, didn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's easy for people to say, oh, we want to reskill or, oh, we've got this, you know, our employees need to transform from, you know, these types of job roles to this type. But you really have to break it down into practical ways for them to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, are you really having the impact that you need? We also use the AI now to help us inform where the organization is going to say, you know, we're seeing increased demand based on signings or pipeline or increased attrition in certain areas that these job roles are an area where you're going to need to grow. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then that also helps shift individuals in their career conversations and their learning plans to those areas. So if you bring the sort of recommendation and certainly the agent piece we talked about in some depth, haven't talked so much about the assistance, but all of these infused with AI, um, you know, there's a big question around ethic. You talked about the fact that there's different legislation coming, even in different cities in the US, <laughs> let alone states. And, and obviously there's EU legislation coming as well. You know, so there's a legal element to this, but there's also an ethics, an ethics question to this, which again, I know from my time at IBM is something that is, con- you know, is considered very important around that. But, but for listeners, how do you ensure at IBM that the firm uses AI and machine learning tools responsibly and ethically? Yeah, so we have done this at a couple layers, right? So the first layer we've done it is for all of our AI, regardless of where it's deployed, internally with clients and product that we build, we adhere to kind of five AI principles. Uh, Explainability, the AI must never be a black box. It must always be something that you uh, explain how it's working, when it's working, where it's working to the user. Fairness. So again, Mm -hmm. we believe that actually AI can help humans. It can assist humans in making unbiased decisions. But fairness is a very key point of the AI. The third thing is robustness. It must be secure. If it's ingesting data, particularly HR, SPI data, we need to make sure that the platform, the AI algorithms themselves are secure. Transparency. What data is it using? Why is it using that data? Where in the recommendations? And then last, privacy. Are there data, is there certain data that uh, the AI algorithms will not use? So those are five principles that we are very clear are principles that every AI solution must uphold. The second thing is then you must, for whatever the use case is, apply certain principles. So as an example, in HR, we believe that talent decisions should be made by humans. That's why we've put in the principle, AI will never be a decision maker. So, you know, we're very clear about for your use case, for your function, whatever it may be, 
are you very, very clear about what those principles are that align to maybe your company or your uh, business model? And then finally, and I know many companies have started this, but I encourage all companies, if you haven't done this yet, to consider it. We have an AI ethics board. So anytime we are going to use AI in the company, it doesn't matter if it's an HR or finance or sales, before that AI can be deployed, it has to pass through this AI ethics board. It's a cross-functional board made up of a lot of different experts. It could be CIO, HR has a representative there, legal. We also have people from the business. And that is the check and balance to make sure that, A, you're meeting these principles and priorities that, that exist in the organization. But it is also the test case that you and the board you need to come back to to show results after three months, six months, nine months, to have the continued license to use the AI in that way. And this helps ensure that, you know, what's initially approved doesn't start to morph into something different. And so that's the model we run to help govern this. I mean, governance is such a huge part of this, isn't it? And, and you know, one of the principles that you mentioned around transparency, you know, that's important that for all AI, I think it's particularly important when we're using it in the organization for employees, isn't it? You know, yeah. to put employees know what the AI is, why we're, why we're doing it, what data we're collecting it, all the other elements that you mentioned around robustness and privacy, but also why we're doing it, why we're doing it from the company perspective, but why we're doing it for employees as well. You know, what benefits is it going to give to employees? Because, you know, employees can see the benefit. They're much happier for their data to be collected and provide their data. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, really, really interesting. Um, let's see, kind of, let's bring it back to, again to the HR professional now, Nicole. You know, with, um, you know, we've talked, uh, we, there's, for years we've been talking about what um, HR professionals uh, need to develop from a skills perspective. We did some research actually at Insight 222 last year, actually, as it related to people analytics. I think we, it can be applied to AI as well. You know, AI is particularly in companies like IBM is it's, it's just part of what we do know in, in HR and the wider business. So what are the new skills that you foresee that HR partners, HR professionals need to develop to stay relevant and add value? Yeah, so some of them are going to be kind of our old standbys. And in fact, they may get even more important. But the one thing I will say is, all HR professionals, regardless of what domain you're in, if you're a generalist or in any of the functional domains, you do have to learn the basics about AI. Um, right. You know, I believe very strongly this is going to transform all of our jobs. And so we can talk more about that. But it means then that this isn't going to be necessarily a tops down, big bang digital transformation. It's more grounds up. How can mm -hmm. I use AI to help my process, my program, my policy, what digital agent would help free up, you know, me from these this administrative task. So I think this idea of having a general understanding of it is really, really important. I think as a result, then what happens is particularly if we get freed up from these administrative tasks, some of these higher order skills, analytics, <laughs> business acumen really making sure that you understand your domain, mm -hmm. your HR domain is going to become more and more important. You know, one good example that we use is with our digital assistant, Ask HR. We were finding that our HR business partners were spending as much as 50% of their time answering transactional questions. How do I put an employee on a leave of absence? Where's the link to the salary plan tool? You know, very transactional questions. Yeah. If an AI assistant is now answering those questions, that means that HR professionals need to spend more time coaching, having role-playing conversations, doing workforce planning. So if anything in this, I think kind of some of the core skills we've been talking about in HR become more important and certainly your domain expertise in your functions become more and more important. Yeah, it's interesting. Kind of, on one of these things, so when we did the research last year about analytics, and I think it's probably can be applied to AI, it was 
consulting and influencing skills, you know, the ability to work with different stakeholders inside and outside HR. But I'm particularly thinking about HR business partners here. Yeah. Um, there is the ability to interpret data, you know, take take the insight from a visualization, and again, take the insight um, from 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 maybe an AI tools giving you as well. There's storytelling, and there's yeah. business acumen. How do how do HR professionals gain that business acumen? So this is one of the questions I actually get asked probably most often uh, from HR professionals, both inside and outside of IBM, of, of how do you learn this? And and look, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer here. I know some HR professionals that take the approach that they make sure that they listen to earnings calls, that I know others that have taken some approach of let's do learning around accounting and finance. You know, one HR professional said to me, and this is advice I have often taken, is never eat lunch alone. So they find different people, non-HR people (laughs) in their organization, and they invite them to have lunch with them in the cafeteria to talk about what's your job as a developer? What do you really do? What's the best thing about your job? The hardest thing about your job? Pick their brains on how they think the job is evolving. That's another great way to do this. And then honestly, for some HR professionals, how they've gained the business acumen is actually rotating into a business job and then coming back to HR. So I think that as long as you understand you need it, there are multiple pathways out there to get it. I don't think one is better than the other. And you can do what fits maybe your career aspirations or your organization model that you sit in. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to remember that as HR professionals, we're also business professionals. So we need to understand, you know, how the business makes revenue, what the strategic priorities of the business are. As you said, listen to earnings calls, you know, listen to what your CEO is saying publicly, because that gives you a few good clues, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, I think that if we just think about this a a little bit broader, that when you talk to anybody in your organization who might be frustrated with HR, there are a couple complaints that they have. They might either say HR is very bureaucratic, where hopefully AI will help you take away some of that burdensome work or process steps. But the second thing they will often say is, Sometimes I feel like you're doing HR just for the sake of HR, um, not in service of the business. So it's a program that, from an HR perspective, seems perfect, but I don't know the return that it's going to have in the business. And so I think that we've always got to guard against those two things and learning more about the business, deepening your business acumen certainly helps you with the second. The, the other thing we found when we did the research last year um, was, you know, for companies that are trying to build that that data literacy, that data-driven, maybe data-informed culture in HR, one of the other things that we found that was really important in companies that were doing that was that there was role modeling by the, the CHRO and the HR leadership team. Now, I know that's the case in IBM because I was fortunate enough to work there, but but what is what are some of the role modeling things that you personally do as a, as a CHRO um, around using data uh, and analytics in, in, in your day to day conversations with with your colleagues, but also with the business? Yeah. So and uh, my team will back this up. I am one of the power users of our analytics dashboard. I'm probably in there running reports, manipulating data more than just about anybody else. But it's one good way. Um, I also, if I happen to be on a meeting where we're talking about data, we're not sure, quickly pull it up, show others in the meeting how to do it. So I think that don't be afraid to do that, whether you sit in the CHRO seat or whether you're an HR executive and HR manager, that role modeling is really, really important. I think, you know, another thing is you think about data analytics, and David, I know you know this. There's a plethora of data out there. (laughs) And sometimes the data can tell you what you want it to say, what you need it to say. So I think another good uh, role modeling thing is always bring multiple people into your data. This is how I'm interpreting this data. And somebody else may say, hey, I think you're missing a key point of this. So have those active conversations and don't just view the data as black and white through your lens or your interpretation. 
And then maybe the last thing, and this is more strategic, but I also think prioritization is important. You know, sometimes people will say, well, I wish we had this data. And sometimes you have to ask the question, but would we make a different decision? If you would make a different decision, go get the data. If you wouldn't, don't waste time. Don't hide behind the data. And so I think that's another thing is that we kind of have to role model a, a little bit is, you know, that element as well. No, no, really, really good advice there. And and I think that leads quite nicely to the next question, because I'm going to you, you mentioned about how um, analytics and AI transform the role of HR. So I think you could probably feed that into this question. So obviously, you'll see HRO a, a, a very much a technology driven organization. It is a technology organization. Where do you see AI going next? What should we be looking out for? And then maybe where do you see it going next in, in HR and the role of role of HR professionals? Yeah. Okay. So this is a big question and it it's is a maybe question. a little bit of an unfair question, David, uh, as we think about, you know, I don't know if anybody knows exactly where this technology is going to land. So I will just start by saying this, but I think that is really important for us to all acknowledge as we think mm. about the role of HR. So as we think about the role of HR, because we don't know where this technology is going to land, we have to create a culture of experimentation, right? This is not a digital technology that you're going to big bang roll out and it's going to be here for five or 10 years. So we have to make sure that in our organizations that we're thinking about how do we create this experimentation that some of these pilots we run with AI may fail. Or we may decide that even if they're successful, they're not giving us the business value we want. So we're going to, you know, stop them. So that idea of experimentation is really important for wherever this technology lands from an AI perspective. I think the second thing that we need to focus on as we're thinking about AI in the organization is going back to the point you made of, can we use data... <laughs> to inform where AI is going to have the biggest impact. When people start asking me about, well, where do you infuse AI in the organization? Your highest volume areas is one piece that I always, you know, give as a suggestion. Your process where that has the lowest satisfaction. Right. So so that's another area that you might want to start with. So we think about those things of using data to help um, determine where you might have some of the biggest impact with AI. And again, I think that's really important for for HR to play a role in that. I think that over time, organizations will settle down. There will be a little less experimentation, that it will become standard in organizations of where you're using AI and where you're not but it's not where we are right now. And so I think the last role that HR um, can play is as you're skilling employees, think about this point of making sure that you're emphasizing continuous learning. Because you don't want to skill employees and say, okay, we're going to end at agents that look like heroes. So let's just make sure that we're training you on how to use an agent like hero. Well, the digital agent, digital labor technology may look very different in six months. And so you've got to get people prepared of here's what they need to do for now. And there will be another leg of this journey. No, it's really good. And and actually to your point about experimentation, I think it's really important. And maybe is HR's not been a function that has experimented. It's been that we do we we wait, we do these big rollouts and we do big bangs and we try and do it across the whole organization. But actually with Hero, you initially piloted that, didn't you? It just in the North American, I think, part of um, of IBM yeah. Consulting, you saw the results. You saw that it could have a big impact, so you rolled it out across other parts of the of the organization. Yeah, and I think particularly as you think about experimentation within HR, there are two challenges most organizations come up against. One is this idea of anything we've done in HR with technology to this point. Think about HRIS systems, talent acquisition systems, even engagement platforms. They have been big bang. 
They mm. have been, you know, your team works behind the scenes on it. Then you launch it to the organization after, you know, a year, two, sometimes three years of working on it. It's a multi million dollar project and it's just unveiled. In this era of experimentation, this is very different. I talk mm. about you're not unveiling the whole house at one time. You're doing little Lego blocks, little building blocks. You put one building block out there. If it works, you might build another one. If it doesn't work, you rip it out and try a new one, right? So that is a big shift in the HR organization. But the second shift that's happening in the HR organization is Many of us and many of our processes get measured on 100% compliance, no defect. We're used to rolling out programs and maybe having a 150-page FAQ where we've thought about every single possible permutation. That's not the world we're living in in either, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to know that we're going to launch something, maybe using AI. People will say, but it doesn't cover this. You're right. It doesn't cover it yet. Maybe next week, maybe next month, as we kind of make the next enhancement. But this idea of minimal viable product and getting comfortable with that, getting feedback on it and evolving, I think, is the next thing. So that, that's the kind of difference for HR is it's just almost become an internal product organization, an R&D function, not completely, but there's, there's certainly yeah. elements of that, aren't there, that maybe weren't there in the past. And, and, and you know, that's exciting, arguably. Um, yes. But it's also a bit different, maybe, than from, from how we've operated as, as HR professionals in the past. I, I think that's really true. But I do think it's a little bit of a shift that we've got to make. And, mm. you know, the way I think about this is every functional area of HR, think of yourself as an offering manager. I am an offering manager. I'm a, I, you know, I, I have a product. I have an offering. Am I getting feedback on it? What's working? What's not? What does the organization like about it? I think a lot of times as HR, we put these programs out there. Do we measure it? Do we measure effectiveness? Do we measure customer sat on it? Um, Do we measure impact, breadth? This is something that, you know, in a product organization or a client service organization, you would be doing all of the time externally. And many of our organizations do that for your external clients. I think we've got to think about operating a a similar way. Yeah. And I think that comes to the the second point from the previous um, answer I'd love to pull up is around continuous learning. Mm -hmm. You know, as you said, things are evolving so fast. We're continually needing to acquire new skills but then reskill as well and i don't know how how you obviously in your role at ibm you oversee the the learning function which is looking at the whole of ibm you know are there any particular skills that you're that you're looking at for for people that you're bringing into the organization or for people in the organization to to really develop yeah so so look this trait this attribute of continuous learning I think for any company is going to be one of the biggest things that you screen for. It will end up becoming one of the things that you may even make promotion decisions for. No longer are we in a day and age where you could learn a skill maybe on your own or at university and it will carry you for a 40 year career. You know, Mm. you often hear people say, right, the half-life of skills is shrinking. You know, some people say it's five years. Some people say it's seven. Some people say it's two, depending on what area that you're in. So this idea of continuous learning, regardless of job role, but certainly in the HR function, has to be a big piece of what, you know, we look for in successful professionals. And as we think about continuous learning, a couple things have to happen. Um, You have to have organizational structures that support it. And David, I know Mm. you know this, but in 2015, we changed our performance management system. And right now at IBM, every employee gets two ratings. One on business results, that probably doesn't surprise anybody. But the second one, is on skills. And business results and skills in IBM 
are equally important. It's not like you can be great at business results and get a high incentive and bad at skills and, and we're still going to pay you a lot of money. Those two things, and it's how we're setting our tone with our employees that what you're delivering today is important, but what you're mm -hmm. setting yourself up for to deliver tomorrow is equally important. And so that's another way that we try to reinforce this point of continuous learning. And that helps create a learning culture because you're essentially evaluating people, as you said, not just on their performance, but on how they're future proofing themselves, but by extension, future proofing the organization. Absolutely. And then it gets underpinned by the thing that we're being transparent through, you know, AI recommendations and data analytics on what skills are going to be the biggest growth areas and the learning roadmaps that we've created that are customized to the individuals. So all of this then reinforces itself in the broader ecosystem. But I think it's going to become more and more imperative that companies all adopt a similar model. No, very good. Very good. Well, coming towards the, the end of our conversation, Nicole, which I'm quite sad about, that I think this is going to be an episode that, that people enjoy um, listening and learning from. Before we transition to the question of the series, um, what, what are the key learnings and tips that you'd like to provide listeners on most of the people that listen to this are hr professionals like 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 yourself like like, like me kind of um you know to, to, to provide to what sorry what are the key learnings you'd like to provide to listeners or where to get started with using ai in hr yeah i think there's a couple things and again ibm's been on a long journey with it but it hasn't been perfect we've made mistakes along the way so if i look back over our our journey on this and you know, if there are things I would have done differently or things that I've learned, there's a couple of them. The first one I would say is start small. You don't have to be mm. big bang. With some of the AI experiments we did, we did go a little too fast. We did try to be too big versus start small. And so again, the way the AI technology is working with is that you can start small. You can launch a chatbot that only does two things. It doesn't have to answer your whole HR talent questions, right? You can get people used mm. to using it. You can get some value out of it. So don't be afraid to start small. The second thing is, and as we've been talking about, assess the impact. There are lots of things that you can do with this AI and some of it might have no impact. Some of it might have incremental impact. So think about what is if you're going to run experiments there's limited time and resources what are the experiments that are going to have the biggest mm. impact invite employees and managers into the experiments with you design with them in mind <laughs> or if you're using a digital agent that's going to transform something for an hr professional use those hr professionals to help design the digital agent. This is not mm. tops down. This can be very much bottoms up. Um, counter fears. Many of us are hearing the dialogue out there about is AI going to replace jobs? Be clear. As administrative tasks free up, what do you want people to do with that time instead? How do you train to get them ready for it? And then, you know, maybe the last thing I would say is create some advocates in the organization. Again, think of yourself like an offering manager for a product. If you're going to try an experiment in HR, find some business leaders that might want to have this piloted in their organization. Learn from it. Have them sell it to some of the other business leaders. And that will help you kind of get the ball rolling on this. No, no, I love that. That kind of user-centric approach is it just... It actually makes so much sense. It's a, it's a it's a wonder why we haven't been doing it longer. With you know, with rolling out programs and technologies sometimes that no one wants to use. And I think this is the this is the change with 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 some of the technology that's coming in now, where we actually do think of it more as an offering. We do actually get the people that we designing it for to actually be involved in the design, and then they're more likely to use it. Plus, you'll make it help us design it better. Exactly. Exactly. So, so Nicol, this is the question that we're asking all the guests on on this series of of, of the Digital HR Leaders podcast. 
How can HR leaders harness the power of employee insights and analytics to revolutionize the workplace experience? Well, this is also a very big question. Dave. It is we a very big question. Several hours on this. Look, <laughs> maybe I'll offer a little perspective. It might be different than some, some other guests. I know many people could answer this question in different ways. I think one of the big shifts as we think about employee insights, analytics, I mean, we've been, as you know, Many, many organizations, the HR professionals have been on this journey for a long time, and we're going to need to continue to stay on this journey. This is not going away. But one of the shifts that I think is happening is we've often thought about employee insights and analytics as us uncovering these insights and telling the organization about themselves. We have too much attrition here. We have not enough capacity here. We're surfacing this and we're telling the organization. For me, I think that now things are being shifted. Because of AI platforms, because of what we just talked about of getting feedback from users, we now have an ability to listen and get analytics and insights from a lot more people in real time. And so, and the AI is allowing us to ingest that feedback in real time. And so I think the shift we need to make is rather than us using analytics to tell the organization, let the organization tell us. And, you know, in some of our AI experiments, you know, our digital assistant, we get thumbs up, thumbs down. People will call an employee to say, wait, why'd you give this a thumbs down? Why didn't it work? It is this user center view to get the data coming to us this way that then is the feedback loop back about how we might change. No, I really like that. That's fantastic. And it was a it's, it is a question that we probably could have spent a whole episode on. So I do appreciate that, Nicole. So. Nicole, we come to the end of our conversation. I, you know, fantastic as I, as I thought it, as I knew it would be. But thank you again for for joining us on the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Can you let listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Maybe find out more about uh, the work that you're doing at IBM. Yeah, absolutely. So you can certainly go to the IBM.com website. You'll see a lot about some of our HR use cases. But I also encourage others to follow me on LinkedIn, where I often talk about experiments that that we're doing and how we're continuing to use data in AI to make our function better. Fantastic. And we'll put a link to the the Hero case study, uh, which is on the IBM site that that we talked about earlier as well. So I think it's a really good example, I think, for to inspire people. Nicole, thank you so much. And um, I, I, I hope at some point um, that we'll meet in person, uh, maybe at a conference, probably where we'll both be speaking, perhaps. I would love it, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.